Good evening, everyone. I'm Ethan Evans. Welcome to this discussion where I'm here with my longtime good friend and coworker, Amish Palasia. Amish is now executive vice president at Capital One, where interestingly, of course, we'll talk about this. He works with other members of my old leadership team. Like Capital One's been like kind of collecting the whole set. It's the Ethan Alumni Club. It is. Um, which is really interesting uh, and speaks well. I hope it speaks well to Capital One, like being much more innovative than some people might think of a credit card company, right? So I'm sure we'll hear a little bit about that. But the thing I really, the reason I ask Amish here is honestly, I think Amish has lived the career journey that a lot of you care about. Uh, he's lived the career journey even more than I have. So, you know, Amish started as an engineering student. Uh, we'll go through his whole career, but he came to Capital One. He's executive vice president there, so a very lofty role. But he was at Google as a vice president, so another big role. And he also founded his own startup. And so he was CEO of Adam Tickets, which we'll talk about. So that's like all the, that's like all the goodness, right? So big career at Amazon, startup, big job at Google, like the capstone of working for one of the Magnificent Seven, now huge role at Capital One. Sorry, I'm talking you up big time, but <laughs> I, I need to do it. And then the last thing though that's interesting, I think, is not everything was roses. There were a couple moves in there, I think, you know, that in the hindsight, you'd say, yeah, that maybe wasn't my sharpest or best move. Or at least it didn't work out the way you hoped. Yeah, definitely. All right. All right. So, uh, Amish, before we jump in, is there anything you want to say or further introduction that I didn't I didn't give you? Well, uh, one, I'm just happy to be here. And I, I know that uh, that some of you know this, but, um, you know, Ethan's been my longtime mentor, manager, and friend, uh, and I've learned an enormous amount. So all of you are participating in his classes. I mean, you're in for a treat. Like, I, a lot of credit goes to Ethan in my career trajectory. So uh, we're, we're all working from him. We, we had a good run together, and that's actually part of what I want to talk about eventually is, like, what made our relationship work? Because really, Amish and I pushed each other forward, right? To just give you the straight facts, he was the first engineer to join my new team at Amazon who wasn't assigned to me by the college program. So the college program brought in new graduates, and several people were just told, like, you're on this team. I didn't know them. They didn't know me. But Amish joined my team. He was the most senior person on the team. The irony is he had a grand total of four years of experience. I was an Amazon senior manager at that point. He was what we called an SDE2. So for those who know the Amazon levels or want to go to levels FYI, he was a level five, I was a level seven. And by the time we ended the journey, I was a level 10, a vice president, and he was a level eight, a director. So he made three levels in that time. I made two. Uh, you know, we build a ton of stuff. We built what's now Prime Video together <laughs> with some missteps. There's, <laughs> there's, there's more than one ugly story. Um, and, uh, you know, then we built Amazon's App Store, rolled it out on a global basis. Amish opened a new office, grew it to 300 people. Uh, and then, yeah, but let's begin at the beginning. So, you know, we, um, I don't know. I don't want to put you on the spot, but it is a little bit of a funny thing. Do you want to relay anything about switching from engineering to computer science? No. Oh. I think you want to you want to take a pass on that. You know, it's it's a funny story, but the 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 reality is is that you know coming from an immigrant family, the the options for me to to go to school is you become a doctor, you become an engineer, or you go into finance and. The, the reality was is that I had started off in college as a computer engineering student. And there was a moment in, in the lab where, you know, I had a bread box, I shorted something out, it's 10 p.m. And I'm like underground in this dank lab. And I'm like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, I, I just want to focus on, on programming because that's what I like. 
That's why I switched. Much to my much to my family's chagrin, they were very like, you're not going to be an engineer after all of this. Like, you know, you're going to be a computer scientist. And they were mortified. And they even called my uncle, who was an electrical engineer. Uh, and, they, you know, they sent him out to come and talk to me and try to talk some sense to me. Uh, so I think to this day, uh, I, I still tease my parents about, you know, their, their kind of wild reaction to it. But uh, it's now funny versus ridiculous with, as it was back then. So I appreciate you sharing that because actually it wouldn't surprise you. I have many more because of numbers. I have many more followers both here and on LinkedIn who are from either first, they either are Indian immigrants themselves or Indian immigrants, uh, you know, the, the children of Indian immigrants. And one of the reasons I, I ask you on here is, you know, there's always the question, did I achieve what I achieved because I am was blonde, now white-haired, but I was blonde, blue-eyed, and white. And, you know, uh, I think you, you truly show the journey they're interested in, which is how can I succeed as an Indian? Uh, right. And so, uh, but the funny part was him facing the family pressure and the, the classic uncle intervention of <laughs> like, what are you doing? You're leaving engineering, you know, you'll be at McDonald's the rest of your life. <laughs> um, and you have to understand both Amish and I have a few years under our belt. Uh, so computer science wasn't quite the obviously venerated thing it is today. It was still a little bit like, well, there's a few geeks at Microsoft, but what good is that? Um, that's so. exactly right. It was like, it was a new field. It wasn't well understood, you know, like, you know, back then, you know, Microsoft was the game in town and, you know, coming out of college, like that's, that's the gold standard. And, you know, Amazon was like a bookstore and people were like, this is like, what are you talking about? And so it, it was very, uh, it, it was very challenging Amazon. for my parents to get their heads around it. Yeah. Mish and I both joined Amazon pre AWS. Right. Like That's right. It, it wasn't pre AWS, pre Kindle, almost pre prime. Like it just wasn't, it was the bookstore. So I actually don't know this much about your history. Tell, tell me briefly how you ended at Microsoft. Cause that's where you started. Yeah. You, I, went, um, you went to UCSD, right? That's right. So I went yeah. to UCSD for, for computer science. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I had, you know, in my head as a, even as a child was, I want to go and work for Microsoft. Um, you know, my first PC in 8086 with MS-DOS and, you know, I'm tinkering around with that and, you know, writing basic programs and, you know, pulling out my, my 321 contact magazine and popping down the little space shuttle flies across. And I thought this is the coolest state of the world. And, you know, coming, you know, coming into college, I was like, okay, this is where, this is where all the, this stuff is happening. This is where the action is, right? And you know, I I was like very motivated to get an internship with uh with Microsoft. And they do a very, very kind of clever thing is they invite everybody out to Seattle in the summertime and they, you know, <laughs> get you in, enamored with the city and uh you know the state and the weather and everybody's euphoric and you're going on scavenger hunts and there's all these really smart people. Uh, you know, you're solving puzzles together and you're writing code in, in giant labs and it's like it's magic. It's it, it really is like they just they, it, the 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 face of it is just su such an amazing thing. And uh, you know, coming out of school, it, it was like this is the place to go, you know, and I, I had fielded different offers with consulting firms and, you know, uh, Lawrence Livermore Labs, I like I had an offer with and, uh, you know, Accenture and a few others, but man, the Microsoft offer to get to work on Windows, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the gray beards that invented, you know, uh, you know, operating systems and, uh, and, and kernels and, you know, it was just like, this is, this is, this is my shot. And so I, um, you know, in the moment, that's where the action was. And, you know, it was a long run, you know, from from when I was a kid to to the time in college, where there was just so much interesting stuff going on there that, you know, that I think that they had kind of a an ebb and a flow. You know, after I left, I think it kind yeah, of the Balmer years were dark years. 
We don't talk years, about right. those, or at least they don't. And Satya has done a tremendous job, you know, turning the company around. Like now it's just this juggernaut powerhouse. And so very, very impressive uh, what they're doing today, yeah. um, you know, especially with the new announcements of, you know, co-pilot PCs and all that. Okay. So, but then, now you're at this storied company. One of the things I think sets your career apart from mine in some ways is the moves you made. And people are very interested in that. So you're at a good company. You're at a good job. You made the choice to move to Amazon and not to my team, by the way. You moved to another team first. So uh, I wasn't there yet. So so what what was your thinking or what lured you across the lake to, to the bookstore? Yeah, well, I think. I think there were two things. One, you know, I had done had a, you know, a, a, a small but powerful run at Microsoft, you know, as a full time employee. And when I was looking for my next gig, I was also evaluating other teams within Microsoft. Um, I actually looked at, uh, at joining the compiler team in VS uh, Studio. And, and then um, I looked at Halo to join Bungie Studios. Mm. And I... Uh, I remember visiting their office and they were like, well, where's your portfolio? And I'm like, I don't know. I, I don't have a game portfolio. I'm not a game developer. I'm a network engineer. Like I built our IP stack. And they they looked at me like, well, we're building Halo 2. And we think we're going to have a lot of online players for this thing. So we kind of need somebody who knows what they're doing. And then they gave me a tour of the office. And I saw people sleeping under the tables and like unbox pizza, like upside down. The place kind of spelled that. And I'm like, these people are insane. Like, like, are they living here? Like, they sleeping here? Here's how they were. I mean, they were working insane hours. But, you know, the big motivation for me on, on kind of making career moves, and this is kind of a constant thread through, through all my changes, is I always felt like I, I needed to kind of move to learn. If I stopped learning or I stopped feeling like I was getting better at something, um, I kind of got antsy and I didn't really understand that like that, that was the, the internal motivation but one you know one of one of my uh leaders had once told me he's like I mean your job is to stretch muscles that you don't use all the time or don't have right um and he's like I feel confident that you could be a good engineer and if I could give you an engineering problem you'll learn how to do that but what about you know uh you know learning how to lead teams or how to be a manager or how to speak in front of other people or uh, marketing or whatever. Like, and so almost every one of my career moves uh, was predicated on that. In this particular case, I really didn't want to be stuck in the mud, just working on some dialogue box and, you know, Microsoft office, like the opportunity that Amazon provided was like real holistic ownership over an area, not just, you own this one little widget in PowerPoint, right? And so that was the motivation that really got me from Microsoft to Am Amazon, which is like, hey, this whole system's yours. We don't like we don't have enough people to do all the stuff anyway. So you get to do all of it. And I, whether whether it was whether it was uh, confidence or stupidity, like I just uh, I I just felt like I could do that. Like I'll figure it out, you know. And I think. I think that helped me get to a spot where I was taking on things that made me uncomfortable um, and going to Amazon, definitely like eye opening, you know, people are carrying pagers around. Like I, I remember when my first week I saw this guy, he, and he pulled me aside. He's like, Amish, I will give you 25% of my salary. If you take my on-call rotation. And I was like, I don't even know what I'm doing. Like I, I barely got my laptop set up. Like, this is, this is crazy. And then I learned what what that actually means to to you know you carry your pager and you you know you get you know, fifty cent twos in a you know pages in in a uh, in a week and you're just like I get it but it's you get battle hard. Yeah, well, definitely you joined he joined another team under a vice president I think called named Jacob, right? That's right, Jacob Lebanon. Yeah, and. Uh, you know, different area, obviously very tough on call. Uh, we'll, we'll see how much that plays into him coming to my team because you were there only at Amazon about a year, right? Before you moved? A little, a little more, but yeah, roughly that. Yeah. So here's the thing, right? I'd love to claim, because here I am talking about Amish and the great run we had together. I'd love to claim I recruited him, but he found us. 
And, you know, somehow, uh, well, I, I'm very curious because what attracted you, it can't have been my veteran status because I was like, I'd been at Amazon in some number of weeks. So it wasn't, it wasn't me. Like I, I'm a, I talk all the time about recruiting and probably me should even admit, I probably taught him a few things about recruiting, but I wasn't the recruiter in this case. So what, what led you to my org or to digital technology? It was the problem. It was, it was one of the, one of those things where the, the thing that you were brought in to go run, you know, which it was back then we called it unbox video, um, Digital video creating an online thing. video service. They didn't exist. Yeah. We were didn't pre exist. YouTube. They didn't exist. Yeah, Netflix wasn't even a thing. Like it, not, it was, not digital Netflix. They they mailed this. The DVD it. thing yeah. was there, but like yeah, the the digital Netflix. There was no premium video streaming service out there. That's you right. could watch YouTube, and YouTube was even small. Like it was YouTube was not the juggernaut that it was then. Like. It, you know, it was cat videos that people were scrimping around pennies trying to figure out how to pay for the damn thing. And so it was uh, it was very, very early on. And, you know, I'm a huge movie and TV buff. And he is. This, I mean, this... let's face it. When he left my team, ultimately, it was to build a movie company. So we'll get to right. that. But yeah. That's right. So, like, you know, the the the, the storytelling of, of 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 the ability to build a new industry was like that is like i don't again is it confidence is it stupidity like we i mean we we were biting off something that was so gnarly and hard and unspecked that i i was just like i was like i love this space i love the content let's go make a run at it and when i when i met with you and and a few of the other leaders like it just felt like we had a good connection. And so I'm like, I think I could do it with these folks and let's, let's, let's go take a run at it. And if you remember the team was tiny when we first started, there was like six or I seven was, of us. I was going to talk about that. So the first team was six people and we, there was this very, it's funny now in hindsight, Amisha, you have a great memory, but I don't know if you remember this. Wired Magazine did a profile of the Yahoo video team. And while, while we were building our product, a profile of this Yahoo streaming video team came out. And of course, now we're all like, Yahoo, yeah, who's that, right? Like a AOL, right? Um, but they had 400 people. And they talked about how that Yahoo had these 400 people working on making a video product. And I and my team, we kind of walked around like, okay, we're good. Like we're confident any one of us can take five Yahoo people, <laughs> but they have us outnumbered like 75 to one. Like we're, we're, you know, if you've seen it, probably many of you have seen aliens where the guy's like game over, man. We're straight yeah. jello. It, it felt, it felt like that scene, like, Oh, we're so screwed. Um, but they're way, they never accomplished anything. Ah, uh, that, you know, but we were six scrappy people. Um, yeah, five of which so, were college hires, five of which were college hires, which is like the nuts part. Like, they like literally didn't know anything from anything, right? Yeah, so, so to be more accurate, just for fun, Amish had four years of experience. There was one guy, Dan Monroe Lynch, who had two years from somewhere. Yeah. There was one guy, Sam Ching, was in his second year, he'd been there one year. There were three new college hires, brand new off the of, like straight out of their degree a month, you know. And then we had a guy who turned out to be awesome. He just left a director level role at Amazon, uh, who was in his second year as an intern. So he had interned at Amazon before, and he actually knew more than almost anybody else because he he knew the Amazon systems from having been an intern, right? Uh, and that was our team. It was six people and an intern um, and me. So... This is really about career, though, not so much about our product. Um, so we ship the product. You will remember better than I will. I'm going to assume that I was able to promote you from SDE2 to SDE3, the senior, the most senior engineer besides principal, after shipment, that, that it was shipment that allowed that. 
Because that's, that's the right. Amazon. I actually don't remember his promo day. I'm, I'm sure Amish would. But at Amazon, you did it, then you got credit for it. Um, and, you know, this audience has heard many of our debacles. They've, they've heard and seen, well, LinkedIn actually did a video. I don't know if you've watched it, but LinkedIn produced a show on the famous upside down video demo at the all. <laughs> really? Yeah, oh, they, have a, they have a seven minute short, a catalyst video. Maybe Jason, Jason's my link master. Maybe he'll put it in chat. They produced a biopic, more or less, on on that. Oh, um, my God. <laughs> well, I, I wrote about it, and they reached out to me and said, you know, this would make a great, inspiring story. Would you retell it on videos? So I, I did, like, a retelling of it. Um, but it was a low point for us. We had a totally disastrous demo in front of the Amazon All Hands. Um. So uh, anyway, though, so career step one, Amish took the risk. I'll just characterize it. Well, interesting question. You said you were attracted to the problem. How did you feel discovering you were the most senior person on the team? Was that like, oh, shit, there's no one to learn from or this is awesome? How did you look at that? I would say um, at that time in my career, I had more arrogance than common sense and so, so you I looked at like, it as this is great i'm in yeah, my deserved like, role I as could, the senior guy i can do whatever i want right like i i can call the shots here and what i realized very quickly was it's also very scary to be in that spot and you know uh you know it, it, it's 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 one of those things where in, in youthful exuberance you you could take on things that you may think about 200 times you know at at my age today, where there you're just like, what's the worst that could happen kind of thing. Right. So I think that's a good point, right? Now, Amish had the opportunity, very unusual, with only four years of experience to step into the senior engineering role on a brand new product. That, by the way, I talk to all of you all the time about the virtue of being at a high growth company. Because honestly, no company in its right fucking mind would take a new manager, new to the company manager, me, and a guy with four, ye four years of experience and say, sure, build a new product. What could go wrong? Right. Um, and, and by the way, with a bunch of college hires under them. <laughs> uh, so we were, we were like the merry band of clowns. Um, you know, and we do have, I, I still pull it up. Uh, do you remember what Corey Doctorow is still a figure, right? He's a writer. <laughs> yes. you remember what Corey Doctorow wrote about us? The headline. Uh, it was like it was it was like uh, eat eat shit and die or something. It was, right. it was something Amazon really... to customers: colon eat shit and die was his yeah. headline. <laughs> um, and it was it was this talks to you about attention to detail. This is a post I could do sometime, Jason. Um, what we did is is we let a lawyer write the terms and conditions of our of our application of our video application and we just assume like the lawyer the lawyer does the lawyer things right well what we didn't realize was just the lawyer did the lawyer things but like she wrote the terms so slanted towards amazon that in the end they said you agree that we can install this application on your pc and you agree that when your rental of a movie expires, we can delete the movie. But by the way, if we accidentally wipe your hard drive, that's okay. That was the, you know, like, hey, she was just covering Amazon's butt. Like, you know, if, if we happen to ruin your PC and wipe out every file and you lose everything you've ever had, you agree to hold Amazon harmless, you know, uh, right. sorry. And that's what Corey caught on to. And he's like, whoa. <laughs> um, you know, and it also, it wasn't even that funny. Like if you'd have written it that way, people would have been like, oh, okay, well, I don't really like that. But like, she wrote it in all this legalese that's like <laughs> obscure and threatening. Um, so a, a free lesson there, I guess, for everybody, just from both of us is, your product can be taken down by the most obscure things. And ours was taken down by the EULA 
that everyone clicks through without reading, except a reporter, probably tipped off by somebody who read it, went and read it and was like, oh, this is comic gold. And so actually, if you Google for Cory Doctorow, Amazon to customers eat shit and die, you can get the whole article. That's right. Um, still. And it, you know, it, we fixed it. Um, <laughs> but uh, not our finest we, moment. We can laugh about it now. In the moment, though, I like, I like everybody was crying about it. Like we were so like, you know, because this is hard. We were, we were not just innovating. We were inventing something. And the stupid EULA was the thing that people were talking about. Not the fact that like you could stream movies on the internet. Like now it sounds so like pedestrian, but like then it was like, it, it was magic. It was like- it, Yeah, it, you it, gotta it, realize we beat Netflix out the door. Now for different reasons, it took us a long time and you could definitely argue Prime Video still hasn't caught up to Netflix, but we beat them out the door at least. Uh, and yeah, we we- so that didn't work out, but let's move on. So my team grew a little and Amish had an opportunity to change to management and you decided to say, you know, talk a little bit about that. And I can talk about why I was okay with it, but talk a little bit about it. Well, I think, I think two things were really going through my head, which was one, how do, how do I have higher impact and higher influence? I think it was a pretty big motivator for me is that like, I wanted to be able to do more. And as an individual engineer, that's just like, that wasn't, that wasn't in the cards. Like I could do a lot as an individual, but to have kind of big scale and big impact, right. To get, to get your job, I needed, I needed to, to kind of take the step to, to kind of change the way I think about it. And I think the second part is, is that I got a lot of positive feedback from you and others around like, my communication skills and my my ability to take technical concepts and and kind of rally not only the deeply technical folks on one side but like business partners, operational partners, customer service people. Like I was able to kind of uh, make friends with a lot of them in my capacity as an engineer, and that tended to be kind of an unusual skill set that wasn't available. And so, a little bit of like, hey, I want to do more, but also a little bit of like. My ego was being, uh, you know, petted a little bit to say like, hey, you're really good at these things that all the other engineers are not good at. Um, why don't you, why don't you take a swing at it? Right. And, you know, much later I learned that like, I wasn't good at it, that I had to go learn a bunch of stuff and fix it later. But like the initial jump into that kind of management chain, I think was really, you know, predicated on those two things. Okay. So just real quick, you must have at this point, talk to at least scores, if not hundreds of engineers and other people about should they move to management or not? Do you, do you, I have kind of a rhetoric in my mind about that decision, but I'm curious, how do you, what do you say to people who are wondering, should I become a manager or not? This is, this is like a, a really, I think an important question is, what gives you energy and what gives you motivation? Because being a manager is not always fun. There's a lot of things that you have to do that are unpleasant or bureaucratic. And if those things eat you up, I don't think it's it's a it's a path that will ultimately drive to your your kind of normal and overall success. Because if you're if you're just unhappy doing those kinds of things and that's going to detract from your ability to be successful, like that's that's the answer. Right. Sometimes it's hard for people to think think about it that way, and I and I would say, particularly when you call out the like, the kind of uh, fact that there's a lot of like first generation or second generation immigrants like myself, there's an enormous amount of pressure pressure to say like, well, how do I become a manager? How do I manage people so I can tell my family that I manage people? And then they start judging you by team size. It is, it's it's the wrong way to think about it, because I like in my opinion. If you, if you get energy from helping others be successful and you get energy and motivation from driving larger impact through others, then there's something there, but you have to take the good with the bad. If mm -hmm. you're like, hey, I really want to solve this deeply technical, challenging problem, then go down the route of becoming a distinguished engineer. Like there's, there, 
the the nice thing about this industry is that most sophisticated companies have paths for both have growth paths for both uh lines of growth right whether you want to be an ic or a manager i think it really just depends on what gives you fire in your belly okay and that that's a lot of what i say i characterize it this way which is almost no managers were educated as managers so we all suck at it to begin with and you have to learn a whole new field because you have a degree sometimes a master's degree sometimes a phd in engineering and then suddenly you're in this field where none of your none of your education applies. Like yes, little bits of it do, and their technical knowledge does. But you really have to relearn a whole new field. And uh, you know, I remember. Um, so we're going to talk about how Amish succeeded. One of the things Amish did was he always earned the top possible rating at Amazon, and he earned it by over delivering. He was rated what Amazon calls outstanding, which is the highest performance rating. And then they have this thing called overall value, which is, uh, and the highest rating was something called top tier. And in his eight years there, how many times were you not top tier? Once, maybe? Once, it was my Once. first year. My first yeah. year I was there, yeah. So, and by the way, that's that's incredible. To be clear, I became a vice president. I was there twice as long as Amish. I was there 15 years. I was only top tier like two or three times, and I still made it to vice president. I still ran a team of 800. So what Amish is talking about is literally like, okay, it's not batting 1,000, it's batting like 900. Um, but I remember even with that performance, his first year as a manager, having to call out something because we had a 360 review process and he had eight people working for him. And seven of the eight wrote, Amish blows off our one-on-ones. Do you remember that? Yes, but yeah. So I, you know, I, I forgive him for not remembering or wanting to black it out. But I had to go back to him and say, like, man, you're killing it. You're still top tier. But like, I've never seen such consistent feedback. All of your people are writing that you skipped their one-on-ones and, and that you're kind of not there for them. Um, and so of course he adjusted and fixed that, uh, and I never saw it again, which is another important lesson, right? He could have said a million things like, screw you, I'm top tier, or, well, I'm doing all this other stuff. I don't have time for that, right? Like I'm doing all this other stuff that's getting the accomplishments that's making me top tier, cut me some slack on that. That isn't what he said to me. He said, okay, I got it. Like that was the whole conversation. Like, okay, I got it. You know, no, no, like you're wrong or what a bunch of dicks or tell me who the one person is who said the good thing about me. So, you know, nothing, nothing like that. Um, OK, so he becomes a manager uh, and our team grows and our product grows. And uh, Amish was honest. He said at that time he had some arrogance and his ambition knew no bounds. I was promoted to director, uh, which was good, but Amish was pushing very hard to become a senior manager, um, which, you know, he'd been an engineer like two years before. Uh, and by the way, uh, a level five engineer. Now he wants to be a senior manager, which is what I had been, but that's not the point. It was a very unusual rank for him to move at that speed. And there's a fun story here that that I'd be curious. What do you remember of your senior manager promotion path? Like just briefly, how do you see that the actual promotion process worked out? God, we're pulling from memory lane here. I uh, I remember I hit some I hit some roadblocks, obviously on the the path there because people were definitely like this is too fast, um, and so that was. That was an incredibly irritating answer to me. Um, and I know that, uh, you know, we came to kind of loggerheads of, uh, a couple of times in that, uh, like, do it or I'm gone kind of uh, mm -hmm. discussions. Um, so that's a key and, point, right? He was willing to quit over it and he wasn't shy about saying it. Now, people now will say, well, it's not a good market. How can, you know, at that time, it was a pretty good market, but he was definitely 
he was willing to quit and he went and got another offer and was like, Hey man, like I'm going. So go say more. And then if you uh, remember anymore. Yeah. And, and, you know, part of, well, the promotion into senior manager, I, you know, I remember it was, it was a painful process, you know, for, I think for both you and I, because I think that you were motivated to try to figure out how to get it to like how to get me there. But the process and the system was not set up for this kind of speed or, uh, you know, this kind of a bet to make. And that, that really was, I think in hindsight, I look back at it as like, I was asking everybody to take a big bet on me and some people were comfortable with it and others were not. And I, I just, I remember there was this like mental, uh, like block in my head to say, they don't believe in me after all I've done, they don't believe in me. And it was a very kind of, uh, I don't know, selfish is the right word, but like a very, uh, egotistical way to kind of think about this prob process and problem. Um, you know, and it, self-centered is, is I would say the, the best way to put it, but, um, God, this and is this like a while been, ago, let's, so. let's just let's give people some perspective. This would have been 2009. So, how old were you in 2000? I mean, we'll give away your current age, but I don't think you care. People yeah. can figure it out. How old were you in 2009? Uh, like mid to late 20s. Yeah. So he's pushing to be a senior senior manager in his late 20s at best, like mid to late 20s. So very early, but he was also a rock star and he had shipped this product. So I think the place, his bet under, I, I want to be clear for career advice. You can tell me if you disagree, Amish, because you've got a lot of career and you can even think about your own org. He did get the promotion. He got lucky. He got lucky in that I was still new to the company relatively. I didn't have the juice to get it done. But we had a vice president above us who was willing to bet on it. And I think the point I'd ask you to admit for, to help other people out is on the one hand, you did great things, you pushed and you were awesome. But a different vice president would have told you, piss off. Right. Right. That, like, I, you know, at that point, uh, you know, this you're, you're speaking of Bill that like jumped yeah, in. Bill Carr. Yeah. So I, I, I you're hundred percent right. If I had taken the same thing to Jacob Lebanon, he would have like laughed me out of his office. He'd be like, park your, park your ass for another three years. And then we could talk about it. Um, you know, I think Bill was a, a much more kind of lean into, to the delivery and lean into the, the kind of, um, outputs that, uh, we were doing, but I also think that he believed in my ability to learn. Right. Sure. And, you know, I, just the same way you talked about it is that like, I would say one of the biggest things that I, I in hindsight, I would look back is that I was not afraid to say I, like, okay, I'm going to fix, like, if you give me reasonable feedback, I'm going to fix it. If you're telling me you're too young, that's not something I can fix. Right. Right. So that like, I, you know, I think, I think you and him were both hopefully, uh, you know, um, excited about the fact that like I was open to feedback and able to kind of take it and incorporate it. And, and then you didn't have to deliver it multiple times, right? Like it would just be done. Right. And now that, that's the kind of, um, I think the, the part of the reason I think Bill was willing to make that bet on me and, you know, and later on we came full circle and, and that happened at another startup, uh, you know, later in my career, but, um, but yeah, that's with, with Bill again. Um, right. Yeah, they worked together again long after Amazon, which we'll get to that. And I know we're taking a long time, but the real story that's worth telling tonight is how has one Indian engineer gone from, you know, CS education, a decent, solid state university, a good one, but not the top school to both CEO and EVP. And that's why I'm going through this in so much detail is it, it's you can copy it, but I want to point out where he was lucky. So let me tell the whole story from my, I remember this very dramatically. So Amish says he's going to quit. And I go to my boss, Bill, the vice president, Mike, I don't know what to do. You know, I don't see how we can promote Amish. You know, uh, I think we have to let him go. 
you know, let him quit. I don't know what to do. And Bill says, Bill had the virtue that he saw that 900 batting average and realized, hmm, this is a guy worth keeping, even if we have to break all the rules. And I respect that. So I learned a lot from that. So you keep your superstars no matter what. So Bill, he went to our senior vice president, a guy named Steve Kessel, and said to him, uh, I'm going to make a Misha deal. And that deal is going to be, if he delivers the next version of our product, I will guarantee him promotion if he stays and ships it. Now, I don't know if you remember that, but that was the deal he made. And uh, that was our first product because of the time in the industry was a download product. You actually had to download the movie and then play it off your local drive. The version in question, I think, was the streaming version of the product. Yep. Uh, so me stayed and delivered it. And so I wrote up his document like, OK, he did what he said. I took it into the meeting to get him promoted. Bill had been called away to do something else. I'm there with the senior vice president and this kind of thorny vice president that also would have told Amish to drop dead, Felix Anthony, who's a friend yeah. of ours. We got nothing against Felix, but Felix yeah. would have been like, ah, get back in your hole. So Felix said, what are we doing promoting this guy? And he starts shooting at it like, Ethan, what are you doing? He's only been a manager a year. You're out of your gourd. And Steve Kessel, the SVP, piles on. And he's, uh, you. I, I'm sure I've told you this, but I don't know how much you recall it. Steve is like, yeah, Ethan, you're insane. Like, we can't do this. And finally, I look at him and I say, well, Steve, we promised him and you signed off on it. And Steve says, and this is like, talk about Terry. He says, I don't remember that. And I'm like, Oh, God, you know, first, the SVP is allowed to conveniently forget things he doesn't want to remember. Right. Like, and second, Bill and I have promised him. Like, we we made a promise. Well, anyway, uh, as it turns out, once I told him, well, I'm sorry, you know, it turns out this is important. Another lesson for everybody who wants to make a deal. I said, well, I have the email string. Like, <laughs> I have the email string that we had about doing this. And Steve's like, well, I guess we have to do it then. He was not happy. And they actually debated. I don't know if I ever told you this. They actually debated going back on it anyway. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, there, there, was, there was debate between this other VP, Felix Anthony and Steve, just a little bit about, man, should we honor that? Like, it's so outside the norm. Should we honor it? And of course, probably, I probably Amisha's promotion caused them all kinds of hell because everyone else in the org is looking and like, well, I'm 35 and I got 15 years of experience. And this, you know, 27 year old, like, People love to do that, right? Like, well, if he's good enough, I sure am. So I've probably caused them all kinds of hell. But I mean, she was promoted. So lo and behold, well, now fast forward his career a little bit. I decide to move to another team. And Amish really wants to uh, get out of the lousy Seattle weather and go closer to his family in Southern California. So my team has an office in Southern California and we very quickly work a deal where he's going to move. You'll, you'll notice this thread, by the way, Amish and I made several deals where we both kept our promises. He said he would move and work for me in Southern California if I get him down there, roughly. Does that sound about right? And so, this is, by he, the way, this is way before remote work was a thing. Like in California was like this huge tax nexus issue for amazon so it was like an, an ask it was like a big ask to like to to get down there like it wasn't yeah, he didn't it wasn't a for simple, amazon technically they had a whole separate company called a to z a number two z and he like moved to this other legal entity that was amazon but wasn't amazon and it was a shell company that made no money so it paid no taxes roughly speaking <laughs> right corporate lawyers man they can do anything 
We yeah. had good ones too. Like we could have a whole other show about the value of good lawyers, I'm sure. Yeah. So Amish moves. Then I'm going to fast forward, you know, because we have a lot of career to cover. We end up being asked to build the Amazon App Store. And, and Amish moves to that team with me because that's like a, a shift in what I'm doing. And we start building this enormous organization to, to be able to ship the App Store in all these countries. Um, and uh, the key is... I need to build a big office in Orange County because we can't hire fast enough in Seattle. So I need a leader for that office. Well, again, I've said to all of you several times, and it's an important lesson, nothing helps like fast growth. I have the opportunity to turn to my trusted Lieutenant Amish, the 28 year old or whatever, 20, 20 something year old, I don't actually know, senior manager, to build his own office in a new location. And who steps up? So tell, is there anything you want to add to that? I mean, this is this is one of those ones where, you know, Amazon's kind of frugality really kind of played a big part of like uh, creating need and necessity, um, you know, when I when I talked to John Schottler, who was like running real estate, I'm like, hey, I need an office space. He's like, go figure it out. I don't I don't have time for you. I'm too busy trying to lease every building in Seattle, trying to find office space for us. So like, I had to learn everything. I had to learn things like what a triple net lease looks like versus a full service gross, and how to like find you know, uh, you know, forget about just like the normal recruiting stuff because there's interesting stories there of like how do you find. A, a whole bunch of technical talent in a market that's not known for technical talent, right? It it wasn't known back then, right? I'm looking at- It definitely wasn't. Like, Orange County, we were hiring from like insurance agencies- Mercury and Insurance and Pacific Life. And, you know, like it, it, it was like, I was, I was literally posting brain teasers on Craigslist that had very complicated questions, but very simple answers, just so I could field like uh, resume responses and like, throw them in the bin if they were wrong. Like, the, like, here's a complicated question and here's the answer is seven. And if you don't email me back with seven, I'm not interested. But like, it was like me in a desk and a phone in like a dumpy strip mall office, you know, and it was, it was wild. And it turned out that that turned into a gigantic site for Amazon, you know, we leased AAA, uh, you know, uh, quality space. We, you know, Worked with the Irvine company, had lawyers involved and commercial real estate and agents involved. I had a union picketing because we weren't using the right furniture, you know, uh, developers. This was all things that I was like, I had no idea how to do any of it. It was like all learning, all, all muscles that I was flexing that I had no idea that I needed to know that ended up being practice for me on, you know, starting my own company. But the, the reality is, is that it was trial by fire, like yeah. all the time. And like, we got our first few engineers. We, you know, we uh, built a prototype, you know, we, we got our office space. And like, I mean, and we were doing, we were literally doing everything. Like, like every, every Friday I would be like, okay, guys, we're all taking out the trash and people would grab trash bags and, you know, the office would be dirty and <laughs> we would, you know, hiring an office manager and like, all sorts of other role types that I, you know, we didn't, you know, an IT this guy. Was, this was Amisha's path to being a, his first step towards being a general manager as yeah. opposed to an engineering manager. And Just there's a, a couple lot of fun stories things. here that, that are worth telling. He had to hire, I don't think they reported to him, although maybe they did, but we had to hire into the office our own human resources people on site. And we got these two different human resources folks from the local warehouse. They came over from the Amazon warehouse and they were used to seeing and dealing with warehouse workers. And so I remember one thing you can imagine if you know anything about US law, warehouses are OSHA compliant, like occupational health and safety, you know, you got to have sealed toed shoes and worker safety and recordable incidents and all this stuff about safety. Meanwhile, I think one of the first crises they had is one of Amisha's engineers is riding a skateboard around the floor. 
hey, you know, the HR, uh, the woman in HR from the warehouse is like ready to fire him, basically. Like, take that skateboard <laughs> home and you ever bring it back. And, you know, Misha's like, whoa, whoa, engineers. Is... Right. If they were wearing shoes, I was like reasonably happy. <laughs> so, one of the just to give you an idea of problems by the way that you will face if you run your own site and you run your own company i'll throw uh do you remember um we had some people who were working on a video game and it was a shooter right and do you remember oh, what one oh. of the artists did they, they i'll let you in, tell this story oh my lord they brought they brought in a it, it was a prop gun but it looked very very real and everybody, like they were using it to model the guns so that they could do a 3D model around it. But everybody lost their damn minds because they thought somebody brought an assault rifle into the building. And uh, like we had security called, HR was like all over it. I mean, it was the conversations that we were having around this. I'm like, what, like, what is my life? Right, like you know, what, what, I'm not. I'm, am I doing any engineering anymore? Like this, this stuff is kind of nuts. But, um, but uh, good lord, one one thing after another. I, oh yeah. So the reason that story is worth telling is, as an engineer, uh, as an engineer, moving to management, moving to more general management. He still didn't own a PNL at this point. Uh, but moving to general management, anything can walk into your office at any time. And I've said this before. And having someone walk into your office and say, someone brought a gun, it's downstairs, you know, uh, on the basement floor. Someone has a gun on their desk. What do we do? Do we evacuate the building? Do we call the cops? You know, you got to be ready as a manager to think on your feet. And basically, good news is the resolution was we went and talked to him. Yeah, I wasn't there. Amish handled it. But somebody went and talked to him and realized it was a prop gun and basically said, can you please take it home? And by the way, never do that again. <laughs> I, it just created a panic. And I, I understandably so, because it looked very real and didn't even have like the orange cap on it or anything. So you didn't know. But the the reality is, is that these kinds of problems just crop up all the time. And like, like I said, if, if that stuff drains you, you know, uh, of motivation, you're in the wrong like change the business you're you're like you're doing the wrong thing. don't be a manager yeah don't be a manager because that's the kind of crazies i mean we've had we've had people get violent on the floors during firings we've had uh extracurricular activities happening at night in conference rooms like everything you can hope think everybody of. knows what extracurricular like i see some smiles yes extracurricular <laughs> relationship activities that's right <laughs> so it's I, we, I think i think we've kind of seen every gamut of problem that you mm -hmm. can have um and you know it's it's I, for me it was all good learning it was all like once you see a problem and you can start doing pattern recognition then your your portfolio and capability to handle other problems that are similar just get better um, but it's super stressful in the moment because you're like, I have no playbook to run this. Yeah, right? I, I got no idea what to do with this. What's the playbook for gun on desk? What's the playbook? You know, yeah. Uh, and by the way, the playbook you want to use, not so. Anyway, so I'll fast forward some more. We have an amazing run. We ship and build the app store. Just as we use the shipment of Amazon's video service, to justify and support Amisha's promotion to L6 senior uh, engineer, and then he became a manager at the same level. We then used his shipment of that product as and his running of a remote office as the justification to become a director. Um, and so let's see. For a short period, we were both directors. Is that right? When were you? Right. Yeah. So then it happened. I was promoted to vice president. Um, basically for the same accomplishment, just delayed a little while. Um, which is another worthwhile lesson. There can be multiple winners. 
because his promotion more or less was he ran, built this remote office and shipped a big piece of the technology. And my promotion was I owned the whole thing. And I was, you know, the, the overall owner. Um, and, you know, so multiple people can win. Um, there was a point I want to make about this. Uh, oh, so well, I assume you remember this, but somewhere along our journey, and by the way, quite a bit before he probably made director, I told Amish, I see the track you're on, and Amish is quite a bit younger than I am, and we were both earlier in our careers, so that the relative distance was a lot more. Like, uh, I had lots more experience than him in the beginning. But I told him, I said, look, I can see where you're going and that one day you will go further than I will choose to. I can see it. I told him one day I could easily work for you. And I was at peace with that. But that's what made our relationship good is I recognized a star. And I think you would say, I'll let you, well, this is a good point because we're at the end of your Amazon career, except for your decision to leave. I can't leave that. Well, I could leave Jason as co-host, but feel free to speak freely without just blowing smoke, what would you say about me as a manager? Because you, at that point, you had spent most of your career working for me, you know, two thirds, three quarters. Yeah. Here's, here's what I would say is that the areas where I was naturally good at in the problem solving and the engineering side, I was able to handle those kind of independently, right? I learned what I needed to learn as I did. I was god awful at managing people and understanding how to to operate effectively as a leader as a leader of leaders uh you know I I had such terrible communication challenges with passive aggressive people which you know I got I I would say I would say this is that my ability to deal with different types of personalities and navigate EQ problems I think is largely predicated on your coaching, right? I think that like, I was not, I was not savvy at all. In fact, I would say where I was raising the bar on, on the engineering side, I was severely under the bar on the kind of people leadership side. And I think that's an area where you were clearly a bar raiser and your ability to kind of not only teach me what, like, how to think about my problems and how to think about how I communicated and problem solve, because I would constantly come into like run-ins with other leaders and other peers and we would butt heads and, you know, we would argue and fight. And, and, and that was the culture of, of like the Thunderdome that we were in. And I would say that like, I didn't know any better. Like I was trying to win every single battle not thinking that I might lose the war because like, because I needed to win every single discussion that didn't, that wasn't the need. But back then I was like, well, if I'm right and I can show the data, then it's the, it's the right answer. And that's not, that's the beginning of wisdom, not the end of it. Right. I think that the, the reality is, is, you know, my ability to navigate difficult social situations and managerial situations and leadership situations I, I I often tell people that like if I didn't have somebody like you, I wouldn't be able to do it, right? Because I didn't I didn't have anybody I could talk to in an authentic and trustworthy way, right? Part of part of the reason I think that you and I work so well together is that there was no BS in our conversations. Like we could just get to the point of like you're Amish, you're acting like an idiot because you did X, Y, and Z. Do you want to achieve this or do you want to just be right? Or do you want do you want to achieve that, or do you want to just show up that other person? And a lot of my personal like learnings on that side, and and I don't know if you remember this or not, but you had you had pulled a, 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 an executive coach for me before I got my director promotion, and like eye opening, I was like, oh, like what what the hell? I mean, you had like we had sidelined me for a while, like it was like almost six months where my my duties had shrunk, but. I was getting all this coaching and I came back a different person out of that. Right. But the investment in my EQ and in, in my people leadership and my communication skills, I think are, are largely predicated on your, 
uh, your teachings. Like I, 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 like it was a total gap for me. So I didn't ask Amish to share this. And by the way, none of this is scripted. We just agreed to get on and talk. So none of our questions, you know, and why was I able to do that? The reason we're just able to get on and chat about this stuff is because we built a lifelong relationship in these eight years of working together. And we built a kind of trust where I can just get on and ask him things. But the reason I'm sharing this is Amish is exactly right. He liked technical depth and I like personnel leadership. So I let him run on the tech and I trusted him. Uh, and I focused on leading the people and, and training him and other leaders. You know, there's, there's another senior vice president at Capital One right now that we may have on the show another time, who's another member of my leadership team at this time. And so, uh, you know, there's a whole cadre of these people that I was investing in. Amish was foremost and had the biggest site and uh, we worked together. But what worked is we did build this trust where I, I could lean on him and knew he had my back and he could lean on me and knew I, I you know, I had his back. And so some of you ask, and I see in the chat a little bit, a couple of questions. First, you ask how to get, somebody asked how to get a GM role. Again, high growth company. They wouldn't trust the trust we got. And so I don't wanna, that's too easy of an answer, but if you want these big opportunities, you've gotta go somewhere where the company's a little desperate for talent and they're willing to take stretch bets. Because when there's all these veterans lying around looking for their next two inches of scope, you're not going to get the big bet. Um, and so uh, I guess the can point I, can, is- Can I add one thing to that? Sure, please. Don't, don't be afraid to take on the ugliest problem in the room, right? Because if you are in a high growth area or a high growth company, or, you, or you're coming in and you, you don't have the established reputation, there's, con there's constantly going to be problems that nobody wants. Right. right. And if, if you if you put yourself in a position where you can build credibility quickly by taking on the ugliest thing at, at a fast growing company and you deliver high quality results, all of a sudden you've just hit the turbo button on your on your ability to ask for larger scope roles and larger scope things like being a GM. Absolutely. And and uh, and by the way, I don't want to I don't want to spend more time on it, but. Basically, just to be clear, Amish and I had this success. We told you about the eat shit and die where our big launch of video failed. Turns out our big launch of the app store failed too. And that's another story I've published before. But our launch failed and we worked an all-nighter and Bezos was flaming mad at us. And that's a story I've told many times. But Amish lived through that and uh, as well. And yet, because we were doing so much right despite these public failures, uh, that he and I shared, we move forward anyway. So now I want to come to the end of the tale for, for the Amazon piece. You ultimately, despite having made director, well, this is important. I'll shortcut part of it. Amis then started to press for, I want to be a vice president. Probably now 31 years old, I'm guessing, roughly. I want to be a vice president. The difference is, and I'm, I'm not going to go into naming names, the leader, the senior vice president who had to make the call on that wasn't up for it. He thought Amish was amazing, but he wasn't at all ready to take that kind of risk. He basically gave Amish the spend three years and call me back message. And that's when you can tell that, well, I want to hear, basically, I wanted you to tell the story of how you chose to leave Amazon to start your own company. Like what yeah. led to this? Well, look, the, the answer of wait it was an incredibly frustrating one. And, you know, I had experienced it already. Um, you know, I've, I had gotten that feedback before, although it was successful in the, the prior one. But like this one was just like, hey, I, I, compared to my peers, I'm delivering at, at a very high scale, high scope. It was just time and seat that was bothering people. And so, um, you know, part of part of my my familial background is like, I come, my, my dad's side, like all, the whole lineage is all entrepreneurs. They all ran their own business. And, you know, there was always this kind of perspective of like, when am I going to do that? And 
I never really had the motivation to do it until I got stuck in the mud of like, I can't, I can't grow as fast as I want. And I think the second part of that puzzle was I was always working with the Amazon safety net around me, like, did, like caring about payroll, like, or insurance or paying the electric bill or that kind of stuff. Like all of those things were things that were just taken care of for me. And so I had no idea would I be able to handle that stuff? And that's, those are like logistical pieces, but what about like running a business development team? What about, can I go make a, 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 a an M and a deal or can I, can I run a marketing organization or can I manage HR people? Or can I like, there was so many areas where I just felt like things were handled for me in a way that I never had to think about them or worry about them. And that wasn't good enough. And then particularly at that age, I was like, I have no attachments. I can do whatever I want, wherever I want. If I'm ever going to take the risk, I better take it now because otherwise I'm going to be a lifer. And, and that wasn't a bad option to be totally transparent. Like mm -hmm. I was a site leader at that point, you know, Orange County site was like 700, 800 people, you know, beautiful location in Southern California, like great offices, you know, I, I had a playbook that I was running, but to be totally honest, like shipping Kindle into more countries, like we had launched in 28 countries at that point. Like, and I'm like, oh, we're going to launch the next device, Kindle 7 HD and Kindle 9 HD and Kindle blah, blah, blah. It just wasn't, it wasn't exciting to me anymore. It was right. things that I knew how to do. And so when the opportunity, you know, I get pitched startup ideas all the time when the idea of like, hey, the ticketing industry needs to be, you know, rethought, rethought through. There's, there's a, a sitting monopoly with Fandango and Ticketmaster, right? And now actually just today or yesterday, uh, Merrick Garland is actually going to, the, the government's suing Ticketmaster and Live Nation for being a monopoly. Uh, but thank God, I, is, is Merrick doing it? Yeah, they, they, they announced it at a press conference. But like, if that was then when I, when I was starting my startup, I would have been so thrilled because this is exactly the problem is like, can we disrupt? Can we disrupt? And so, a confluence of events brought me back to the movie industry to say, hey, do you want to do you want to take a run at this? And here I am, very comfortable in a good gig with lots of people, surrounded by lots of people who I respect and trust and admire, and they do the same for me. And I, I felt like I needed to take the risk. It was the moment in time where I was like, I got to jump because if, if I don't do it now, I'm never going to do it. And I'll never I'll never know do I have the grit to run my own company, right? Yeah. And for whatever reason, that was an important question for me. Like I, like I really wanted to know, could I, could I do it? And of course, you know, uh, my, my dad was super proud of me, you know, of taking that leap. You know, that was one of those, you know, di different things for mom and dad, you know, but like my dad in particular for starting, like taking the, having the courage to, to jump uh, was I think, helpful in my like uh personal being to like want to go do this but <laughs> um but yeah like I, I i think that the uh could i do it is the timing right and if i failed what's the worst that happens like it's not like i'm like i'm not it's not like i'm failing when i'm 55 and i'm like i have no idea what i'm doing it but i had i had energy in me and motivation so that's that's what got me to to start looking around and then i started going Created, you know, created a pitch deck, you know, started shopping it around with different investors. You know, we ended up getting Lionsgate, the movie studio, and Michael Burns, the, the vice chair of the studio, was, was an amazing advocate, our, our, like our kind of godfather of the, the whole enterprise. And he led me around town. And there's a whole Hollywood whirlwind story of meeting stars and actors and getting folks like Steven Spielberg and The Rock and J.J. Abrams on the cap table and getting movie studio chiefs on the ta you know, cap table. I mean, it was it was a wild thing. And that's like, that just kind of took off. And I was like, okay, I, I got to go. I got to go. And that, that's, that's, when I, that's when I decided to, to leave safety for the unknown. And I think, I, I, I truly believe that my career growth is... It, it, there's a large part attributed to be, being comfortable being unsafe. I think, thank you for sharing that. These will be some of the points, you know, Jason will do a little clip cut 
I'm sure. Um, that's like a great quote is, is you were willing to leave multiple times. You were willing to leave great jobs for new risks. So I don't want to go on too long about this because you have so much career and we've gone in depth when you and I worked together, but what was hard? Um, what was hard about being a CEO is much too broad. What was surprising and what are like one or two things you'd be like, oh, wow, I didn't know this. And I would want to tell anybody who thinks they're going to start their own company X and Y, because there must be some things that jump out to you. I think the biggest the biggest thing is it's the loneliest job in the world. Mm. It is. It's terrifyingly lonely. There's nobody. Nobody cares that you're sad, upset, a pitch went wrong. You know, you get in your own head. You you're worrying about payroll. I mean, I was floating company expenses on my credit card, you know, I, like selling assets in my 401k. Like it was, it was, there were moments in time where it got so to the wire uh, close. And I have, you know, at our peak, we had about a hundred people max. And I'm like, these people put food on their table because of what I'm doing. And if I fail at what I do, there's no like, there's no safety net. There's no nothing, you know, like they're, they're like these people are going to quit. And then if they quit, then the company goes down and all this hard work that all of us have been doing is, is gone, you know, and it's, it's terrifying and it's lonely. And I, 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 I can tell you having done it once, I'm glad I did it. It's a good life experience. I don't know that I have it in me to do it again. If somebody, if somebody came and told me, Go, let's go start a startup and you could be the CEO. I don't know if it's a, like a later stage company and they said, okay, you want to be the CEO of this company. And it was established. And like, I didn't have to stress about like, I have to go pitch 90 investors and there's going to, somebody's going to put the screws to me and they're going to like lawyers are going to try to out negotiate me. And like, I, uh, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. Like a, a, much of the gray in my beard is from those years. Like I, like, you know, you see those pictures of like uh, Obama when he started office and when he left office. That's a hundred percent me. Like I, I like I just like I I destroyed any semblance of work life balance in that moment for the for the for the thrill of of the opportunity. And I don't know. I I, I would just tell you, you have to want it so so bad. Do not do this casually. Because you won't, you won't succeed. You just won't. So I'm going to tell you both sides of the story there, right? From my viewpoint, I tell people, and you'll respect this because it's exactly what you did. There is one promotion you can always get if you want to promote yourself to CEO. Just start your own company. Like it is the instant path. No one anymore is telling you if you can raise the money or hang out your shingle or or whatever bootstrap. It is the promotion to the very tip top with no waiting, no scope, no documents, no review groups, no peer feedback. It's the path to the top. And Amish took it, right? He had, had a huge run, but he got stopped. And he's like, I'm going to take it. But I coach some CEOs also, and they all echo what he's saying, which is in the end, you feel this enormous pressure. See, everyone from the outside, and I'm sure you know this, Amish, because you've been on both sides. They look at the CEO and they're like, oh, you're the CEO. You're in charge. Everyone has to do what you say. You don't have to report to anyone. That must be the best job in the world because you get to make all the decisions. But what they don't tell you is you get to worry about every one of those decisions. Like, yeah, you get to make them. I can phrase that both as a gift and a curse. You get to make them. You're in charge. That's the good part. You get to make them. If they're wrong, it's you. That's the bad part. And it's the same thing, right? If you're the CEO, right. you're 100%. You have 100% of the power and 100% of the responsibility. And yeah. So it's a lot. It's a lot. And it's it's super stressful, super stressful. Right. It's right. not it's not easy. So uh, I don't want to keep us all night. Um, so we'll keep moving. Um, Adam Tickets does well. It reaches a point 
where the technology, which is your strength, is built and it needs biz dev to succeed, which is not your background. And so must have been, you know, uh, I've given the polite version of the conversation because I don't know. But like, tell us a little, you ended up making a move with the support of the board, but I think also, or, or the investors, but also their encouragement. So say a little about that transition and where you went. Yeah. So I, um, you know, about four years into it, you know, the machine was built, put a dollar in, out comes a dollar 10, just requires more and more funding and more and more, uh, as you said, marketing deals and in areas where like, I was not an expert, you know, uh, we had launched a set of TV ads and I had just like, this is, this is for the birds. Like, this is not my cup of tea. And candidly, I was getting very run down and burned out uh, by the whole thing. And so the idea was hand, hand the business off to my co-founder, let them, uh, let them continue to do the schmoozing and, you know, meet with investors and do the tours from, you know, New York to Boston, to the Bay, you know, Sand Hill and down and just keep rotating and one of my investors was uh, Lionsgate, as we said, and the vice chairman, they had just bought Stars Television. And they were like, hey, we need to get our digital assets in place. We need to get like our operations in place. Can you help us? And, you know, Michael it was an in incredible partner to me and, and, you know, kind of the similar trust that you and I have, he, he and I had as well, uh, particularly in Hollywood where it's a town full of jackals and, you know, he's a, a shrewd, thoughtful, you know, businessman who uh, like created an incredible company. And he, you know, he took me under his wing and, and I felt like I needed to return the favor. So, you know, he um, invited me to join Stars. I went there for a year and helped get their operations back on track, get their, their streaming app in place, get, you know, their digital marketing sorted out. And this is where kind of one of like the first big missteps of my career happened, which is. And that's why I wanted to get to this is I know. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So this is, this is, this is like, I was there a year and, um, and we got a lot done in that time and launched internationally and did some M&A and like, I did a lot of, a lot of fun stuff for, for the company. I was living in Denver at the time, you know, flying back and forth uh, between Denver and, and Santa Monica. And what I realized was, my relationship and my partnership with, with Michael and the Lionsgate team was very different than the one I had with stars. Like I just wasn't culturally aligned with the way the stars team was working and things that they found important and the values that they found important and being data driven and all of the things like they, like we didn't see eye to eye on so many fundamental values, right? On execution, we can, debate, discuss, and argue about how to approach a particular problem. But if you don't actually agree on your foundational values, it's really hard to, to build a partnership, a, th a thoughtful partnership. And so there was just a, like a, a pretty sizable impedance mismatch. And my mistake was, I assumed that everybody would work like Michael, right? He, and he's the vice chair of Lionsgate, like he, and he was my partner and investor and the godfather of Adam. And like he did, like I knew him. And I trusted him. And when, when I moved to stars, it was a different ecosystem and we just didn't see eye to eye. And so there was a lot of kind of soul searching because that also was a very good job and a lot of great perks and, you know, staying at nice hotels and flying nice, you know, flights and all like, it was a very Hollywood story. But again, those trappings, who cares if you just hate it? you know, hate working with the people, like the, the culture within the company, the people were fine. Like, I, like, I don't want to speak ill of anybody yeah, individually, yeah. but, but sometimes you just don't align with the culture. And so one of the biggest mistakes that I ever made was not paying attention and asking and interrogating what, like, what is the company culture like? What do, what do people value? What do they care about? How do they talk to one another? How do they debate? What, what do they look like in the, in the worst when, when, you know, when Netflix and Apple TV came out and they, everybody was like, oh, my God, they're going to eat our lunch. What were they talking about? How do they how do they get in the trenches with everybody else? And we were just not aligned. I mean, I, I remember sitting in a C-suite conversation and they were talking about like, oh, that person wore last year's Tom Ford 
tuxedo, not this year's. And they were like making fun of people like, oh, the the operations team was like, they started a band and like, that's so dumb. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like these people are just having some fun and like, who cares what year or suit they wore? And meanwhile, I buy my clothes on Amazon. So like, I'm not one to be a fashionista, but like, this was like ridiculous kind of conversations. And that's like easy stuff to talk about. The more business related stuff, I was just like, this is insane. Like we're getting our lunch eaten right now. Like we got to go, we got to, we got to think about this problem in a much more thoughtful way. And nobody had that. It was all based on how people felt. And, you know, it was just like, a, as I said, impedance mismatch. And so I, I washed out of there pretty, pretty fast. I felt like I did what I needed to do to repay Michael and, and Lionsgate for their generosity. Um, but, um, but it wasn't a long-term fit for me. So I think if I were to summarize, I appreciate the piece in particular where you talked about assessing an organization's culture because uh, work can be exciting or, or challenging or mundane, but if you, if you fit with the other people, it's pleasant. And if you don't, every day is kind of a misery because it just leads to fights and feeling de devalued. Um, and so one of the biggest pieces of advice I would give, and it sounds I, I do give people, is investigate what the work environment is like um, because you have to live in it every day. And so Amish calls it one of his first career missteps. Um, it's culture match. It's not digging into what am I joining. Uh, okay, so... Um, you made a move from there. What? So it's pretty obvious what led you to move. You wanted out of the bad situation. Yeah. How did you pick your next stop? Well, I got called by Bill. Um, so Bill was, as we talked about, was was Ethan's previous uh, manager, and you know my skip. And I have a, a huge amount of respect for him. And when I heard he left Amazon, because he was running video and music, I mean, a huge organization. Uh, very high profile. And when he left to join a startup called OfferUp and he called me, he's like, hey, I need help getting this place into tip shop shape, ready for an IPO. I was like, well, I wasn't thinking about OfferUp, but like if Bill calls, you take the call and you go and interview. And, you know, when I went there, it was like this sleepy giant. Like there was like so much usage, you know, 88 million users or some some bananas number lots of you know engagement they were having a hard time just keeping the systems up and running like just outages after outages and that was like candidly after grinding it out for nearly 11 years at amazon like you learn how to op be an operator right yeah sure so uptime like is not a something that threatens us fix the right, uptime right. problem it, 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 it was like it was it was easy to like think like okay i can fix 95 percent of these problems just by low-hanging fruit and and then the, the question was like, am I ready to come back into a startup ecosystem and take another run at it? And the metrics look great. The the people seem very earnest. Um, you know, the founder was still there, you know, and then Bill was there. And the fact that the founder hired Bill, you know, to be the COO was like a really good sign to me because it was like, he recognizes that like, he doesn't have the skills to take the company to the next level. Because oftentimes going from zero to one is a very, very different problem going from one to a hundred. And, you know, Bill is a one to a hundred guy, not a zero to one guy. Right. And so I kind of hitched my wagon to that and said, like, if he feels confident around this and I'm looking at, at the information and I'm feeling optimistic about it. And I feel like the problems that they're having are easily like within my wheelhouse felt like a really good opportunity. So I jumped, uh, you know, I moved from Denver. I, crazy enough, I had bought a house. And then three months later, I sold the house um, and moved to, uh, back to Bellevue, uh, to Washington, and, um, you know, started at OfferUp and was there for two years. We went through lots of kind of standard startup problems, you know, uh, you know, fundraising efforts. You know, we bought uh, another company. Uh, you know, we we did a lot of the stuff that I think I had a lot of good background experience in because of my path through my own company and through Stars, and that's um, 
that with all startups, it, the picture looks rosy when you start, and then there's always problems underneath the, the the couch. And so the couch cushions, you have to kind of lift up and look, but you only see that when you're there, right? right. And by the way, there's no company that's perfect. Everything, everybody has challenging issues, right? So, but we got we got the place to a profitable spot. We we uh, had two quarters of profitability, and that's when I got the call for, from uh, from an executive headhunter for uh, Google. So before you go to Google, which I really, I want to talk about, you know, the, your career up to now, um, connecting dots, there's a power of networking. Uh, Bill called me about OfferUp, and I said, I'm not interested in moving, but I, Amish and I, because we're friends, I knew he wasn't happy at STARS. And so I said, but I think Amish is probably available. And he was thrilled. He's the same guy who took the big risk to keep him in the past. And so he called Amish. And so while OfferUp was a good job, it may not have been one of your best, I don't think, because you were happy. I, I won't go into the details, but you were happy to go when Google called. Yes. And Bill yes. had already left also. So Bill had kind of seen some of the problems under the couch cushions that Amish talked about. Yeah. And said, well, Amish, you got this. I'll see you later. And gone off to write the book, Working Backwards. Um, brilliant book. I've recommended it before. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, Amish was happy to go. Talk, talk, talk about Google. And, you know, you were happy to leave offer up. But it's interesting. That's a great call to get because... Nothing about Bill that working at Stars and then Offer Up would necessarily sing Google, right. particularly because you ended up working on Gmail. So talk talk a little bit about how that happened. Yeah, so I mean, look the because I don't know of this me, story. Yeah, like like the culmination of all, all of the, all of my career up until this point had just given me such a broad amount of leadership uh, training. And and like skills on a lot of different dimensions, not just simply technical. Mm -hmm. That I, you know, when I when I spoke to 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 Google, you know, they they were on the hunt for a leader to run Gmail calendar and chat. And By the way, a billion users. When he talked to me about taking the role, he said, "Look, it's a chance to own a product with a billion users." Two, okay, two that's products. Scale. Two. Yeah. Right, calendar and, and Gmail. There's only 17 in the world that have a billion miles or more, and and this was like two of them in the same bucket. And you know, I went through the the interview process, and you know, I think everybody's familiar, but like, it's tough. It's 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 no joke. Like uh, like they, I had I had you know principal engineers asking me esoteric details about like our digital ordering pipeline at, at Amazon when we were like trying to figure out optimistic fulfillments and pessimistic fulfillment. And like, we were getting into quite detailed pieces, but then it was also a lot about people management and how do I kind of, how do I, how would I handle an org of 200 people versus 500 people versus a thousand people? And what, what differences do I, I make? There was some stuff that I knew and some stuff that I had like an intuition about because I had like experienced it and some stuff honestly stays the same. It just gets at a bigger scale. And I think that having worked at lots of different environments from a people perspective also helped me navigate the, the, the interview well, because if I had just come in with Amazon sensibilities, they would have been like, no. But the fact that I had started my own company, the fact that I had worked for other, other places, I had a body of evidence that like, I knew how to kind of work around. Now, to be totally candid, I didn't think I passed the interview. I I thought like, I thought for, for sure the engineers were going to ding me. It turned out that they were the ones that were most excited because almost every candidate was coming in was like a consummate people leader, but they had no technical skills or they would get super technical people, but they were like insanely terrible EQ. And the balance that I brought to the table was I think the thing that was attractive to them. Um, and I, I think, I think that just goes back to like, for, for your audience is that like, always make sure that you're, you're strengthening your weakest part of your portfolio, right? If you're, if you're really good at X and you know, you can learn X, stop thinking about that. Think about the thing that you actually suck at and figure out how to elevate that, because that's just going to elevate you as an executive 
to have some sort of balance. Now, you don't have to be an expert at everything, but if you come and ask me like, Amish, here's a PNL, right? I can walk you through it. I can tell you what's going on, but I, I promise you most engineering leaders, if I did that, would not be able to do it, right? And like those kinds of skills that give you kind of a broad version of it, give you a lot of perspective and also give you the opportunity to latch on to these moments in time where somebody's looking for kind of an uh, all around athlete, not just a specialized one. And that's that's where that's where the Google process went. And you know, I uh, I was lucky for them to 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 say yes. And uh, you know, I joined and um, you know the left offer up for it. So now we get uh, since we've been going an hour and a half, and I, there's a couple questions people have asked. I want to get to. We'll fast forward all the way across Google. Um, here you are at Google, one of the Magnificent Seven, one of the Fang, blah, blah, blah. Most people would not, you know, that's a chair they would sort of try to glue themselves to. Meanwhile, Capital One, I won't put you on too much of a rough seat with your current employer, but credit card company, yeah. right, is how, how, how it would be viewed externally. Now, I, of course, know I have lots of friends there, but that that is, you know, they'd be like, hey, man, like, you know, what's in your wallet kind of thing. But yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so what was the appeal to look beyond Google, which many people, because I have some idea of executive compensation. I of course not discuss anything I might believe about Amish, but I'll just say he didn't need the money, right? Like Google pays very well at that level. You know, your team was what, 3000 people? Was that what you told me at one at, point? At, at Google, it was about 1200. And then here at Capital One, it's like 3000. Okay. So it's 1200 people though, huge team. So, what was the appeal? I mean, I know, by the way, that we have mutual friends and you certainly were talking to some people that you knew at Capital One, but what was the appeal to leave? Yeah, I mean, look, you know, I told you my, my dad was proud of me for starting my own business. This was the first job in 40 years, uh, you know, or whatever, my, my career, 20 plus years, that my mom was proud of me, right? I mean, she was literally calling people in India telling her like, oh, my son, my son runs Gmail, you know? And, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it was... It was much to everybody's chagrin. The question that you're asking, I think, is a is a common one. Um, here's what I would say: is that I, you know, I I interviewed as a favor to our mutual friend Rob Pulciani. Right. I'm not thinking much of it, thinking like I'm I'm fine. I have a great job, very prestigious. Like I like I and like pays well, does all the things, and like I get to work on cool stuff. And um, and when I met you know my my current leader. Uh, Rob and and the, the he's the CIO for the company and and the COO and I got to meet the CEO our founder Rich. The vision and the the story that they painted was incredible. Um, it is a you know people, everybody says that they're a tech, technology company, and you know I, I even asked Rich our founder I'm like it, you know everybody says that like why do you think that he's like well look half half of our full time associates are are builders in one way or another most of them are engineers. We're investing time and energy. We've moved, uh, he uses a phrase called, we've uh, crossed the canyon by moving into the public cloud. Not this like nonsense, public private, you know, cloud where most of 99% of it's private and it's just basically you're running your own data center and calling it a cloud. But like they really did the hard work and they had the conviction and courage to get to that right spot. They're one of, they're, they're one of Amazon's largest uh, AWS customers. They're, the largest serverless deployment in, in the planet. Um, like it's, there's a, there's a remarkable number of technological innovations. And the thing that really got me was they allow their leaders to have a lot of, of autonomy and agency to solve the problems that are put in front of them. They like, they look at, they look at somebody like me and say, look, we have these five things that we need to go figure out how to get done. Here's your budget and here's your people go figure it out. If you need to hire more people, go do that. If you need to, to, to 
to spend more money on pizza parties, go do that. Like, we don't really care. Like, we just want, we want you to lead with thoughtfulness, empathy, and, and, and great execution. And again, this was a, one of those moments in time where I wasn't going to make the stars mistake. So I really kind of inspected the cultural side of it. And these are really just amazingly kind people that really give a damn about their employees. And, and, they put their money where their mouth is when it comes to this kind of stuff. And so I was just like, Hey, this is a, this is a big opportunity. I can have a very sizable impact. It is actually tech. And this is a place where I can have an outsized, you know, uh, level of contribution because at Google, anything I wanted to do ever was just an act of Congress. Right. That was the downside of being there. Like you have a, if you have an app like Gmail that has 3 billion users, and you want to move a button five pixels to the right, all of a sudden you have 20 million pissed off people that are like, how do you like, my script stopped working, my this didn't work, or, you know, Sundar wants to get involved in the, you know, what's happening here, or, or the admin community for all the executives are like your product managers. Like, it's, it's like, it's kind of a crazy situation where you can't really do a lot because the products are so massive, but here, there was like a, a big greenfield opportunity where they were like, run, do, do your, do your thing, Amish, because we trust in you to be able to build the things that we need to take us to the next generation. And that was very, very appealing, very empowering. Um, which is, I think the reason that it caught me. All right. So obviously I believe it turns out, I believe in capital one, just by the number of leaders that I either knew or led who've chosen it. So Amish is there. There's another uh, person who was on our team at App Store. Kem Lesh is there. Uh, Ian Suttle, who worked next to us, is there. Uh, Rob Pulciani was one of my peers on App Store. He's uh, in the C-suite there. Um, I've never been inside Capital One, uh, but you can look at the number of high-quality people choosing it. So it's clearly, it's clearly got a lot going for it. Um, so we take the full arc. This is Amish, you know, his uncle's intervening because he's leaving engineering. That's the beginning of the story. Now we have a 3000 person team, the EVP title, you know, working directly for the CIO at an enormous, super public financial institution. That's the arc and all in about 25 years even even less maybe. So that's what's possible. And the thing I would want people to take away, sometimes it, it's not only race and color, but it is to note, some people say like, oh, don't make excuses, right? Amish went to a good school, but not the top school. It wasn't Harvard and it wasn't MIT, neither business nor tech, um, you know, comes from an immigrant background, lived the dream was his own ceo huge role he's he he's got lots of time he can do whatever the hell he wants next right i mean you know he might be with capital one 10 years um i will say you know hopefully this will end up public on youtube someone not me can forward it uh to i, I will just warn the top people at capital one feed the man red meat he's hungry <laughs> that will never stop. So, you know, I've lived this. Um, don't don't think, you know, that what he's doing today will keep him amused tomorrow. Um, I'm, I'm just telling the truth of living the experience. Whoever you are, if it's Rob who's managing you, Rob, I manage him for eight years and you don't have that time and seat yet with him. He's amazing, but you're going to have to stay ahead of him or get run over, which is OK. I was I was happy to be run over. Um, and obviously that's why we're great friends is, is I was at peace with the path I took, but for, I will also say, you know, I, I said that I recognized Amish would exceed me. I reached VP at Amazon. I ran big businesses, half a billion dollars, a couple of them. I led teams of up to 800, uh, you know, 
Gmail's way the hell bigger than that as a business value. I don't know if you can put a value, nor would you want to talk about it necessarily for your Capital One responsibilities, but 3,000 people is almost four times my scope. So, you know, he's lived the dream. So in closing, Amish, uh, someone asked a really good question. What are three tips to improve your EQ? Where, where would you go? You know, you said how important that is. How should someone learn that? Well, I think, I think first of all, start by assuming positive intent and demonstrating positive intent. This is an area where I kind of struggle with today even, where I know in my heart, I'm like trying to help people be better and grow them and, and make them awesome. But sometimes it doesn't come across that way. And so we, I think one is just be very mindful that people know where your heart is. Because if they know, if they know that, you could deliver really difficult messages and they will, they will trust in you, right? But if they don't, if they, if, if they feel like you're coming from a bad angle, they're not going to be receptive to like constructive criticism. And that's, that's a downward spiral, right? So super important to build trust and, and show positive intent and assume positive intent, by the way, on the other side of the table, if you're arguing with somebody like stop and put yourself in their shoes and ask those questions. I think the second thing is, is that, you know, at this scale, like delivery matters, right? What I say, you know, has a blast radius that's quite big, even a small, like, you know, we could be joking around and like I make a small snide re remark or a, you know, a half-hearted criticism, but you have to realize that like some people take it much more seriously than others. And we have a very interesting time now where we have lots of different generations in the workplace, whether it's Gen Z and Gen Alpha or millennials or Gen Xers, like we have the whole variety at Capital One and the way you communicate with them, it, it, it lands differently depending on what you say. So your delivery is a big, big deal. And then the, the last thing is I, I would just simply say is that know what battles you need to pick and know what, like, wh like when, when is it appropriate to like argue the point and when is it okay to let go? Right. Mm. A lot of my internal stress and my, my unhappiness was because my, my fists were closed too tight. When I, when I remember to like, let go a little bit, I oftentimes find that like, if this doesn't matter, this is not the thing that makes the difference. And so let people do like let people make mistakes if they're if they're going to make them or be open to the idea that you might be wrong and and by letting go a little bit i think you you will relax yourself but also uh, engender an openness in your environment okay one more question then we'll wrap it up top couple books or podcasts if people want to learn if people want to get on your journey top couple things top couple books or podcasts that have influenced you that you would recommend? Um, I love Good to Great from a business uh, book perspective. It's like behind me somewhere here. And right. then this one is, uh, this is like my third copy because I keep giving my, this is, this is a new one. It's called Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. A new one. A new one that's a, a new one to me. years sorry. old. I, I mean, I mean <laughs> a, a, new, a new copy of the book. Uh, sorry. But this I like I I read this blog article of like how almost every major world leader has has a copy of this that's like super annotated. This particular copy with, with the red bird on it, it's an amazing amazing set of pieces of wisdom that like I sit down and think about some of this stuff. Like I try to read like a couple of pages a day, and how is this guy this smart, right? And so there's just there's just life lessons in here that I would just say, you know. Good to Great is an awesome one because it's about people getting the right people on the bus and then and then deciding where to go. And this one is about managing yourself. And and I, yeah. I that, that, those are the two that I would call out. Awesome. Stoic philosophy, right? Like I, I assume you've also read uh, Lucia Seneca and Letters from a Stoic. I have not. I've, I've just actually just started my Stoicism journey. So I'm like, I'm just getting into it.
but I will uh, I will definitely pick it up. Yeah, Seneca and Letters from a Stoic, it's very complimentary to Aurelius. Uh, and look, I'm not like, Stoicism isn't the be all end all of everything, but I actually tell a lot of people the wisdom in the ancients, right? Like Book of Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, you can get a lot from uh, Eastern wisdom. Um, so because the ancients had a lot of time to think and they saw a lot, you know, thousands of years of history. So um, and they weren't bothered by things like, you know, Gmail and calendar interfering with everything. So. <laughs> right. All right. Well, you've been very generous with your time. We're at almost two hours. Uh, any last thing you want to say, parting words? Otherwise, I will let you go and I will go eat with my family. But I'd say for all of you listening and watching, listen to Ethan. He has a lot to teach you, I, like incredibly valuable for me. And I wish you all, all lots of luck and, and success in all of your journeys. And for my part, of course, I think the world of Amish, we were partners. Of course, he technically worked for me, but I see us. I think that might be the key, right? If you look at how we interact, that's how I always treated him. And so if you want to be a strong leader and have amazing people, you know, I have a love for Amish, uh, and I think he felt that. And if you have that relationship with your people, they will do amazing things. And then when they do find a better opportunity, you'll be as happy for them as they are happy for themselves, right? I would, you know, uh, I, I'm... I'm super proud of Amish and, and, you know, we get together from time to time. We were just talking before we came on the call that my wife and I are going to go see him. Uh, but that's, that's my relationship with a lot of employees. So if you want to lead well, you got to care about the people because one of my heroes, last quote of the night, I'm looking behind me because it's Teddy Roosevelt, uh, President Theodore Roosevelt said, um, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care and it's great to be the smartest man or woman in the room it is uh that won't get you nearly as far as people believing that you're pulling for them so with that we will wish you all good night